2022 alone, India witnessed 4,61,000 road accidents, which claimed the lives of 1,68,491 individuals. These are not just figures. These represent shattered families, extinguished futures and broken dreams. The most important aspect of all of this is that all of these lives could have been saved. India, unfortunately, has some of the worst record when it comes to road crashes in the world. Now, why share these grim statistics here when we have the heads of safety, logistics and supply chain of some of India's top corporates? Well, it's because safety is a universal concern. It demands collective will and action, not just from the public enterprises, but also from the private sector, which is rooted in best practices and good policies. My name is Miloni Bhatt, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this third Thought Starter conversation of the ET Road Safety and Safer Mobility Forum. This is organized by the Economic Times, and it is powered by Netrodyne. The topic for today's conversation is the safety circuit, enhancing safety in supply chain and logistics. And I'm very happy to welcome all our guests here today. I have with me uh, Mr. Shiv Kumar Balasubramaniam. He's the Senior Director, India Business at Netrodyne. Wonderful to have you here with us. I think among all of us, you're the one who has been part of now, uh, you know, all the conversations that have been under the ages of the ET Road Safety and Safety Mobility right. Thank you. Forum. So we're looking forward to hear from you and some of the insights that you could share. Uh, we have with us Mr. Rajiv Mehta. Uh, he's the Senior President and Chief Logistics Officer at Ultratech Cement. Thank you very much, sir, for being here with us. Thank you. Then we have Tejal Tyagi, Senior Director in Environment, Health and Safety for Africa, Middle East and South Asia at PepsiCo. Tejal, wonderful to have you here with us. Thank you. We have Venkat Venapalli. He's the VP Supply Chain at Mondelez India Foods. Welcome. And Arpit Raj, he's the Head of Logistics and Customer Service, Godrich Consumer Products Limited. Welcome, Arpit. All right. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to start first with you, uh, Mr. Shiv Kumar. Talk to us about why do we have the ET Road Safety and Safer Mobility Forum, the thought behind it, and also the vision and mission of Netrodyne, which is a company uh, that uses uh, computer technology and AI-driven technology to ensure safety on India's roads. Okay, so let me try to answer you with uh, two decades ago, whenever we used to visit uh, developed countries, so to speak, uh, on official visits or on holidays, we would always be amazed by the infrastructure. We would look at the roads, we would look at the lighting, and we would say, wow, if only we had this in our country. Cut to today, I can tell you some of the roads in India are better than that in the US. And I'm not exaggerating. If you take the Atal Setu Bridge, for example, where I was last month, I was lucky enough to travel, 22 kilometers on the sea. Or if you take the Bombay Nagpur 800 kilometer expressway, and there are plenty of such road projects, you think that Indian roads are now better than the, the developed country roads. And still, the statistics you said, 19 deaths an hour, uh, 400 or uh, whatever people are dying and 1.67 lakhs per year is the worst in the world. So our 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 CEO and his uh, chief technical officer got together and they, they thought ki if everything is perfect and yet people are dying, so what is wrong? So we analyze the roads, we analyze the lighting conditions, we analyze the tire technology, we analyze the brakes, we analyze uh, so many other factors that go into everyday mobility and transportation. And we realize that people are still dying. The only time people did not die was in COVID when everybody was sitting at home. So that made us seriously think that there is some connection when people come to the roads and they get to behind the wheels. And who, what is that connection? It is the people who drive the whatever is the automobile, whether it's a truck or whether it's a car. So generally we focus on commercial vehicles because that's where we feel we can contribute maximum to society, whether it is buses or whether it is trucks or even small commercial vehicles like the Boleros or the Yodhas and stuff like that. And our management standpoint has been, let's tackle and go to the root. Like the Japanese say, go to the root of any problem and see what is the issue. And we analyzed that the problem came from the drivers. So our vision is how to make sure that driving behavior gets better. Uh, how to analyze driving behavior. For us to know how driving behavior gets better, we have to analyze driving behavior first. How do you analyze driving behavior? It's a subject never thought of before. AI has to come in because we have to note down, record, miles after miles, facial recognition, driving patterns, all these things have to be collated and multiple, multiple miles, million and billions of miles of data have to be, you know, properly analyzed. Then you come to understanding a pattern. 
the and understanding the pattern is the key here because then you will know who drives how in what kind of conditions the moment you are able to crack that then all you have to do is make sure discipline is enforced but before discipline is enforced you have to come to the root of the problem and understanding that has taken us 7 years of hard work and we have now 13 billion miles of data with us nobody else in the in the in segment in india has this kind of data and data is gold because based on the data we are able to analyze we are able to perfect we are able to constantly improve uh, whatever uh, feedback we can give to corporates uh, who have large fleets with them thousands and thousands of uh, trucks and buses are flying on the roads so we hope with whatever insights we have gleaned over the period of time we can be of some use to india we can be of some use to saving lives we can be of some use to families who have their near and dear ones and probably the only breadwinner driving on the road and just as a matter of fact let me add driving is something nobody wants to do in india no parent wants their child to become a driver of especially a commercial vehicle because it's the most thankless profession on earth the salaries are low the working hours are extremely mm. rigorous you are never at home you are always traveling and your health suffers you have back aches you have uh, severe sleep deprivation you have mental issues so nobody wants their child to become a driver so today in india we are having a severe shortage of good drivers and they are gold dust actually so that's what i recommend to every corporate that whenever you get a chance please train your drivers and make sure they stay with you you know we'll talk about some of these issues that you've pointed out but i now want to open up the forum and really start from your vantage you know as people who use roads and also as uh, the heads of health and safety you know logistics heads of your specific companies what would you say are the main problems or the challenges when it comes to road safety in india we'll start with you sir yeah see two things we have observed over a period of time one is the functional competence and second is behavioral competence both are equally important as far as road safety is concerned in india i think to a large extent seeing the number of population we have got almost 37 lakh trucks flying in the country okay. and for that you need trained drivers how many drivers training schools are there one is the training schools second is the behavioral corrections you learn something but then you have to be corrected on a regular basis about your behavior pattern so both the two things which are missing as corporates we are trying our level best that how can we correct those things and how can we contribute towards that all right important and very interesting points teja yeah sure i think uh, when we talk about india and i think you shared a very good statistics and uh, if you also look at the, the the report which is published by who on road safety right the biggest challenge we see is with the lower income and the middle income com countries like india it's with respect to the external environment we operate in right and uh, when everybody and it impacts everyone whether it's an employee of an organization or any third party logistics service provider or i would say the most importantly uh, the member of the public and this is the highest risk activity we do currently uh, in our country the biggest challenge would be in terms of india is the external environment with respect to the kind of infrastructure we have right so right. there is a lot of scope still we see in terms to of improve. The, yeah improve the road infrastructure uh, accident management uh, absolutely and then then uh, in, importantly it's uh, in, in law enforcement so mm. we do have laws but how do we better enforce that so that people are just not wearing the helmet to see that there is some kind of possibility yeah. to get the fines right but yes they are really uh, doing it by heart so i think law enforcement is also one of the biggest uh, challenge and there is also lack of uh, mandate in terms of driver training so today you get license and who is actually making sure that there is a proper training provided to the driver in order to make that license uh, and eligible right mm. uh, so that's uh, something which uh, i think we see as a clearly a challenge and need to be tackled all right no good points you know both of you have mentioned about uh, you know the issues of drivers starting of course with mr subramaniam uh, mr meth also uh, pointed out and now you've uh, talked about it so i think we'll delve into the issue of drivers but before that uh, venkat would love to hear your points i think just building on my colleagues i think I, the profession itself is not considered as a technical profession and I, just to give you I mean, if i if you were to engage somebody to run in machine in, in a factory the mm. amount of training they go through even yeah. before they come and run the machine right so 
the drivers as a profession is not organized well. I think just they are not trained before they actually become a driver. And because the profession doesn't get that respect which it is due for, a lot of people don't spend that effort and time to yeah. become real professional drivers. And if you are not, then at least you should have supplemented that with a culture of safety, which is again missing. For us, we take safety culture for given. Hmm. Or for granted. Or granted. So now when you club both of them together, you are almost putting a ticking time bomb on the road every second. Yeah. And when most of the things happen, I mean, you may be you may be part of that eventuality. Now, even if it is not your mistake, yes, I think that's where the challenge is, right? How do you make this profession much more professional? So proper training goes into before you become that prof get onto the profession, and then build a culture. I think I think a big effort goes from corporate in terms of building the culture, safety as a culture. If you see, you know, these. It's not only as a private organization, it, it becomes a pioneer foundation pillar for us. All right. Safety of people is important. And that's where we spend a lot of efforts. Probably, you know, we can dwell into a bit more on that. So I think uh, broadly there are three pivots to it. Uh, the first, I think some of the fellow members touched upon. One broad pivot is about vehicle technology, mm -hmm. which is an important one, which I think uh, Mr. Subramaniam also delve on how can we look at doing. The second is about compliance, uh, which is with the BS6 compliance coming yeah. in. Uh, there are multiple uh, talks about uh, blower cabin or AC blower cabins by 2025. The third one being about uh, the road infrastructure, mm -hmm. which is about NH as well as state highways being developed. Effectively, in all of this, I think the one piece which has been missing is about the m amount of intervention the human factor yeah. has to the incident. And when we talk about fleet uh, safety management, and essentially for majority of our organizations, we have always talked about the fleet, right. so to say. There has been little or uh, to no development or categorization in terms of the types of drivers that has come into a, a particular premise to pick up the trucks. What is his experience? Is there any accreditation that he is to know? What types of vehicles is he? Is he, is he a passenger commercial <laughs> vehicle? Is, is, is he a goods commercial vehicle driver? I think a lot of categorization is important. Mm. And once, I, I always say that uh, unless something gets measured, it will not get improved. Right. The so first piece is that you have to measure where you are mm. and then probably try and look at in how categorization and in which sort of categorization you would want to focus the trainings on, and then you can go about improving. I think the other aspect to this, interestingly for me, is the fact that, you know, when we talk of safety, right, road safety, for instance, I have a kid in school, and, you know, the kids always taught, uh, from the point of view of a pedestrian, don't cross, you know, when there is a red light, or, you know, don't spit from a vehicle, but never taught, you know, don't honk at the vehicle in front of you because the kid is never taught that you are ever going to be, you know, hold or be in a vehicle which you are going to drive. So that kind of education is not given right from our schools. And then, of course, the drivers, you know, as pointed out, they come from uh, the economically marginalized class of India. They don't even have the basic education. A lot of them are lacking that. Some of them have become helpers and then have gone on to become drivers. And, you know, all of these issues have come to the fore. So we've hit the problem on the head right at the, right at the beginning. Everyone said that, yes, uh, you know, we need to intervene as far as drivers are concerned. I'd be very interested to know, you know, from your uh, specific <laughs> organizational standpoint, how are you measuring some of the things that Arpit spoke about, you know? How are you categorizing drivers? And if you have fleets which are supposing leased, then what are the challenges with that? Yeah. So most of the time the fleets are leased. So you do not have any direct control over exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. But nevertheless, safety being a priority, we do take care of precautions like e-passport for drivers where we look at what type of experience they are having, what type of vehicle they are driving, whether that is matching the requirements or not. All sorts of these things are being taken care of. Then technology is playing a big role. Right. 
you come to know through your systems that whether the drivers are prone to harsh braking or you know speed regulations violations etc so the question is that you are trying to give them behavioral training as well as functional training also through your driver management centers right so it's more towards capability building of the drivers on a sustainable basis it right. is not a one time training which can solve the problem so you have to do it on a continuous basis right but you know what do you think of the punitive measures like for instance harsh braking is that is there a punitive action taken against that particular driver then exactly the first is that punitive comes later first right. is to correct them okay that your first is why it is happening so you have to change the behavior okay. and most of the time i think people are receptive receptive they listen to you so that was my next question are you facing trouble you know when it comes to changing driver behavior and how much you can actually influence if you have leased fleets so i'll go I, we we have a mix of both leased and dedicated vehicles and you can see the starking difference on the behavioral aspects oh. in both the spaces because in a dedicated vehicles even if they are leased they are dedicated for us the drivers come on the fleet every day day in and out and the leased is basically you it's any random can land up at your facility in the dedicated when you spend lot of effort because they are constant so you keep training them you keep looking at their performance go back to them and talk to them so over a period of time they come to a stage where you feel comfortable that they are you know very much adhering to the expectations of behavioral aspects of it but i think even in that case we should be slightly careful because they are one amongst thousand on that place who are behaving well when they go on to the road right i think the society itself a general behavioral you know aspects on the road also time because you are one among the good lot of people who are not behaving as also they keep going back so you have to keep investing in them and keep reminding that it's about you you know managing the what you are supposed to do don't worry about the others then you look at a normal uh, regular fleet that we have we we put in lot of efforts when they come into our sites to look at you know are they capable to drive the sort of vehicles that they're driving and all but it's it's bit random for us so the person mm. may never turn up in his life again sometimes he may turn up in the life there are mm. people who do turn up so sometimes we have started working with our partners in recognizing so we we do like we we started doing drivers um, uh, celebration every year right so we have started getting the drivers frequent drivers together and uh, you know recognizing people who have done a good job within the knowledge that we have highlighting their you know importance to the organizations you know leadership being there and spending time with them with you know as, and recognizing their efforts and asking them to do well so i think it's a constant effort that you need to put today it's not that you can say okay he has been with me for 6 years so he'll be doing good mm. again you have to probably the frequency will get reduced but mm. the effort has to be there to constantly remind them All right. Okay, Arpit, you have anything to add to this? So I think, uh, see, road safety just one cog in the wheel of entire end-to-end -end value chain safety. You cannot pick up uh, one piece and tell that okay, I'll I'll make I'll road safer yeah. <laughs> and effectively ensuring that the other yeah. aspects will will work. fall into place. I think, uh, as an organization, and uh, this might be true for other organizations as well, you have to focus on end-to-end -end value chain uh, mm -hmm. safety. both for uh, i think manpower primarily uh, then second is your goods and the third piece being your other associated infrastructure the way we would go about essentially is that you start by sort of delving in the vendor selection process itself to try and see on what types of vendors you are looking at uh, putting safety as a clear check while doing that Uh, you have an objective metric to track it. So, for example, in in GCPL, we have SHMS score that we took sort of look at doing for each of the warehouses. And slowly, uh, when you start doing that, effectively, you can take help of technology to try and enable both in terms of getting services better while utilizing that very own technology to encompass some of the features of safety into it. So, mm -hmm. for example, if I would take, we have a transport management system. which basically tells you the optimum route from which you can serve Correct. a customer it now what it can also do is that the concern transport management system can also tell you is how do you should go about loading that truck so that while unloading the the boxes come out 
in one piece and, and does not for create a safety hazard at the unloading point. Effectively, how do you go about doing that so that any jerks which are there during the transit, yeah. that is taken care of? Right. Now, there are technologies which are available, but if it is only dealt from a safety point of view, essentially might not be there. Oh. Uh, and secondly, if you look at only from a road safety standpoint, might not give you the best result if you are only trying to change at one leg. I think it should start at the factory and should end uh, at, at the consumer point and right. essentially should be emphasized throughout the process through as, as uh, some of the fellow panelists through functional and behavioral training and to, to the final consumer. No, of course, wonderful point, you know, that safety is all encompassing. It cannot just be, you know, our driver behavior or whatever. What are your thoughts on it, uh, Mr. Shiv Kumar? You have corporates who come to you for solutions, tech solutions. Uh, tell us, you know, give us your insights. What happens when they take these tech solutions? What are the barriers uh, to adopting technology? So before I answer that, I would like to answer, or rather add on to what he said, Arpit added. That safety definitely is a key point, but in addition to safety, there is logic also that is involved. So I don't know how many of you have seen the film Ben-Hur, in which there is a chariot race and uh, where the hero actually races with the emperor and he, with basic rudimentary technology, mm -hmm. whereas he's got all the savvy technology and he realizes which horse runs the fastest and which horse runs the slowest and accordingly he switches the position and therefore the balance is maintained well. So what our device does, what technology does, we understand driver behavior and we will know which driver will make maximum mistakes on a particular route. So mm -hmm. if the route is itself, in the uh, to begin with, as you mentioned, if the route itself is dangerous or not uh, smooth or a lot of bumps and chances of accidents are high, we will put the driver who is the best driver on that route. And the drivers who are prone to making errors, you put them on safer routes. Mm -hmm. So that is one way to distribute the risk and make sure that your goods reach from point A to point B safely. Apart from this, the question you asked about technology, I have some very very interesting uh, incidents. So we installed cameras on certain customers and what our device does is between this car or this truck and that truck in front, it analyzes the following distance. The speed at which you are going, the speed at which that vehicle is going, the relative speeds, time to collision, beautifully. It tells you any time, three seconds to collision, two seconds to collision, etc. So the customer took it. After one week, he's calling me and saying, Sir, dusre side se gaadi aayega to uska kya karne ka? <laughs> so I'm saying like, but dusre side se gaadi kyu aayega? No, sir, India mein gaadi aata hai dusre side se. <laughs> so, and then we were flummoxed. So our engineers, and we are selling this in bucket loads to the US. They love our technology because there everything is streamlined. But we have no answer to what happens when there is a vehicle coming in the opposite direction. Similarly, we have something which analyzes lane departure. Mm. Uh, and in countries where there are proper fixed lanes and the vehicle is running properly, the moment you switch lanes, the road yeah. itself will send out a, and your device will send out an alert. So the driver is immediately alerted. India has no lanes. Yeah. So again, the engineer is saying, sir, what do you design? How do you design? Third point is, when there is drowsiness and the device is sending out a beep and the driver is supposed to listen to the beep and park it aside, okay, let's take a breather. So, the, the customer is now asking me, Are you beep to de diya, but the driver ruka nahi. <laughs> he has not listened to the beep and he's not. Uh, I said, Then what can I do? Yaar? After giving out the beep, also, if he's not willing to listen, so this is the level to which we have to go. Mm. We have to groom from here mm. and then bring up to here. So you can add whatever technology you want to add, mm. but unless the understanding is there that this technology is for my benefit and uh, for the benefit of the people using the road at large. Much what are the challenges? I, yeah, that I, think, I think if I build on that and exactly the point which he was mentioning, the, the biggest challenge is the knowledge gap, right? Because mm. still people are not very much aware about the benefit, how this AI technology can be really beneficial, not only from the safety point of view, mm. also from the operation efficiency point of view, right? Because it's a, it's a big, very big point. And um, that's where I think industries have to invest more in training the employees and training the organizations and bridging this knowledge gap which is there so they understand the application and the benefits of it another important uh, i think barrier would be is the initial high cost right so yeah. initially when you are going for the implementation Very it's a high cost and mm -hmm. For the small and medium uh, scale companies, if you look at, it's not really very much affordable, yeah. right? And hence, there is a need again as an industry bodies to come together, pull the resources and having a kind of a common shared technology platform which can be leveraged by all the small and medium scale industries, right? This is, this is very important 
if we want to really expand in terms of the technological advancement in the country right mm -hmm. another thing if you see like he gave example of that we already all the organization have the existing systems like the the yeah. transport management system and it's very important any new thing we bring in should talk to the existing system right. because ultimately the the objective of having going towards the digitization is to simplify our efforts and simplify our right. work right we should not add into the complexity of what is already having so right. i think how beneficial it would be how best way we can talk to each other and make things simple for the organization that will also actually increase the adoptability and can have the uh, the better usage of this technology in the organization so yeah that would be my point so is is so so cost is a deterrent for a lot of companies when it comes to but adoption of this. If you remember when mobile technology came into India first, what was the incoming charge at that time? 16 30. rupees per minute or some 20 rupees per minute. Mm. Aaj ke tariq mein sab free hai. Mm. So once you level, reach a level of commoditizing the entire technology itself, then uh, I'm sure the prices will go Where down. are we at that? We are still at the initial stages. So it is still very expensive. Paanch, that paanch, means at least paanch the saal to lagega for it to be... Uh, at a normal dash cam. What level. happens in the intervening 5 to 10 years? What do we do? Yeah. So, you know, cost is one part of it. Mm. But leaving that apart, we cannot compromise on the safety. It has to be our topmost priority. How to address it? Mm. So, the first thing is to moving towards a low cost solution, which is moving towards functional capability. Mm. That is the stage one. Behavioral, we have already spoken, and now how to use the technology. That technology may be costly initially, but if we collaborate as an industry with the technology providers, I, I do not foresee that there is any reason that it will be very expensive. As was rightly said by my co-speakers also, that industry per se has to collaborate with each other, mm. and we can come out with some solutions which are cost economic as well as effective in improving the safety. But my question is this, you know, in industry, each industry is different. How will you bring about a standardization? What are the standardized norms for safety that we will adopt? What are the challenges to actually getting everyone to sit down, to devise that, to come to a common minimum program, which then, uh, you know, can be implemented? What are the challenges that you see to making all of this uh, something that can be adapted and then scaled across industry? See, you, somebody needs to anchor this, right? I mean, so we are a very diversified exactly. country with a diversified industry portfolio. At the end of the day, the common person is the truck and the truck driver are probably some of the people who are trying. There has to be an anchor to it. I think I mean, that's where the partnership with the government and you know the ministries comes in place. And like for example, like if you go in a developed nation, there's a very simple rule that you can't drive beyond eight hours. Eight means I mean if you, sometimes you would have seen in the developed nations eight. I mean the guys drive stop the bus in the middle of the road and said I'm done with eight hours. If I drive one more minute, I'll be punished. I can't drive you anymore. Sorry, get down and take another True. bus. So there has to be norms which has to be set, which, which and then only industry can, I think, accelerate in partnering mm -hmm. that and taking it forward. Like what we do, as you know, Arpit said, eh, we set a very clear expectations to the service providers mm -hmm. from a safety point of view. This is what I need from you, right? Mm -hmm. We are we are doing that, right? To, to I, I need to understand how the driver's performance is, right? It means if only if I know the driver's performance, I can you know come back to and give you a bigger right. business. So we can set an expectations for the service providers, but that means then they have to start incorporating the technology into it. Right. Now, what is a norm to it? How do you drive a norm? And how do you set a norm saying the driver can drive only eight hours or 10 hours? And depending on what the country can afford to do is, there has to be an anchor to it. I think that is where a partnership with the you know, ministries and I mean, there's a lot of forums. As an industry forums, we start talking about it and, you know, Try yeah. to encourage to get there. Because, you know, even uh, the drivers and the people who employ the drivers, uh, they are also facing a time challenge, a cost challenge. You know, they also have to uh, run their businesses within the remuneration which is being provided by companies. And they also have to make it cost effective. More than that, they have to make it profitable. Okay. So they are going to push uh, the drivers. They are definitely going to push the vehicles. 
So in that scenario, you know, when it comes again, the pressure is with the cost. Then how do companies... So my, I, have a, I have an observation here. In, in developed countries, uh, the people who own the trucks, 70% of the time, they are the drivers themselves. So, and that's a huge difference in the thought process. Ki mera gaadi hai, ye road mera hai, mera, and I'm supposed to, and they get paid extremely well. So some of them make much more than tech uh, entrepreneurs or, you know, they get paid extremely well. I'm not joking. So the point here is, unless people have that ownership, ki ye mera truck hai, ye saman mujhe pochana hai, and then implement whatever tech is. So for example, if you do a small program in the US, we have hundreds of people who come together to understand what AI is, how it will benefit me. And most of them are the owners of the trucks and the drivers themselves. India, mein, I go into companies and I tell the safety manager, yaar, apke driver ko jama karo, yaar, itne devices apne liye. none of them are understanding what the tech is doing for them. They are not able to see the benefits. Sir, aaj gaadi nahi hai, driver nahi hai, loading pe gaya hai, ye busy hai, problem hai, truck breakdown hai, workshop mein. I swear, I go to the root source and I try to tell them, boss, I am here to explain what technology is going I'm not able to get the people because the safety manager, the owner, the etc, etc are totally disassociated from the people driving the trucks. People driving the trucks don't want to know anything about technology. Sir, you put the camera and observe us, sir. They see it as an intrusion. Intrusion. Yes. Yeah. That is the basic difference. Until this doesn't go, right? How, how have you all managed to deal with drivers who... Have they been first accepting of technology? Yeah. So I think... That's that's absolutely right. If you imagine for a second that some camera is installed in your vehicle, right? Yeah. How, and how it's going to look you at you are. all yeah, the time. Exactly. So yeah. it's it's not that easy and straightforward that they are going to accept it. Right. It's a process, right? And and when you are part of an an organization or it's it's a kind of a condition of employment for you, yeah. and you know that it is for your benefit that organization is uh, actually wanting this device to be fitted so that you can drive safely and it will help you drive safely. Uh, but but they're you wondering are, if yeah. you're looking or you're waiting for them to make a mistake. Yeah, but it's then that's the message which we have to actually tactfully manage. Give, yeah, uh, give to the driver, right? And it's the biggest challenge. But then it's a process, as I said, as we get more data and we are not directly getting into the any punitive action like he mentioned, right? right. It's a process which we follow where we leverage those data and we coach the driver that see look at your behavior and many times it's it's not intentional right, right. and we are all human we make errors we may, we are distracted with, with with many reasons behind that right and hence when you see yourself doing that you will be more aware that yes i made this mistake and the organization with all good intention is asking me to correct that with the right kind of a coaching with the right kind of training and with the right kind of reward and recognition, that will actually so then so, help so us behavior really. shifts happen. Absolutely, yeah. yes. they are. Yeah. Absolutely, they, I, I think if you say, what are we trying to do? We are trying to shift the culture. Mm. Punishing them is not going to help you initially. It is rewards right. which will help you. Right. And very importantly, you will never get the transition unless until they see the benefit. What is in for me? Mm. And we are all humans. If mm. there is nothing That's in for me, why am I spending my time here? We all think, right? But it's unless until you bring that in, what is in for me, make them understand what is in for me. This is for your safety. This is not to monitor you. Mm. So this is, you know, this will enable you to go back home to your family. Mm. This is not to get me another five cents more from the trip. That plays a big role. I, that's what I was saying. You know, we can easily achieve that when I have a dedicated fleet for me, yeah. the same drivers coming back to me every day. It's easy to bring that. Somebody is coming to me from a leased vehicle once in 40 days, they'll never get the message what we are trying to do. It definitely happens. It happens with time. I, I, culture never builds over a period of year yeah. or two. It's a, it's a huge journey. I, I completely agree that, you know, though we have leased a truck's population, but 60% of the drivers are dedicated. They come back regularly. So when we train them, Initial resistance may be there, like GPS. Mm. In thousands and thousands of trucks, we have introduced GPS in the last year, few years. Initial, it was that you want to go with geofence routes and you want to monitor that which route we are taking and all those things. But today, it's a accepted norm. Nobody is objecting. Right. So it's a very, you know, base acceptance now mm. that this instrument is going to be here. No resistance. 
So it clearly indicates say, it's a matter of time, maybe another three years, four years, five years, but technology absorption has to happen and people will accept. You wanted to say something? The first level of, um, uh, I think the first level of adoption would come through compliance and which would be, which would warrant through the OEMs making change in the infrastructure. Right. For example, uh, somebody said about uh, monitoring of drivers, right? Uh, in, in a nation where we don't have uh, AC uh, blower enabled cabins, effectively the basic level of fatigue would get the better of the driver itself. Right? So, so that should be the basic level so of cabin first, that we should have for drivers. Yeah, so the first piece obviously would be to drive say certain change which is mandatory for the OEMs to be put in for each and every commercial vehicle, which will ease the driver's pain at least to, to alleviate to a certain extent. The second part, obviously, is in terms of the adoption. You you uh, mentioned about varying industries, essentially. Uh, see, the industry might be put the commercial vehicle to different uses mm. in different industries. However, the providers of those vehicles are essentially common at the back. Right. right? So, if uh, a, a transporter X is working for an FMCG company, it might be the similar sort of a transporter might work with a with cement industry. And essentially, those are the kind of uh, players who would be the enabler in these changes, which has happened to some of the transporters right. who have sort of said that only uh, there are certain class of drivers who I will be recruiting. I would not be recruiting a drivers below certain uh, educational threshold. We would also not be recruiting, say, driver who have not been accredited in, say, ABC. And essentially, that has led to a lot of changes Specifically, obviously, it, it helps if you are a, a transportation company of scale and size, but that change has uh, enabled many of these bigger organizations to do that. Okay. And I think that is something which will eventually come. But the first leg of change would definitely come through compliance and through uh, government intervention. So in terms of government intervention, you know, at the base level, from where we are right now, what would you like to see? You want to start up with? So I think there are two, three uh, pieces that I would uh, want to touch base on. The first is in terms of uh, the road infrastructure, which I mentioned about. For all the work that has been done in, in constructing national highways and state highways, if you take the proportional accidents that has happened, it is still highest in uh, NH plus SH combined rather than the in-house roads. So how do I go about doing that? is uh, there are technologies available right now which can be adopted at the OEMs and to limit the speed at which uh, a truck can fly. So that is one piece that can uh, be looked at from uh, an overall uh, national highway standpoint. The second is in terms of if, you'll, if you're applying a long haul, which is say 2,000, 2,500 yeah. kilometers, is there ample amount of stop gaps, stop yeah. points available for the driver to go and freshen up on the way. Effectively, I have seen a huge lack of facilities available in, in major long hauls, even now after so many progress in terms of the national highway. Third is in terms of the intervention and that has started slowly coming in is in the types of vehicle that has been prone. Right. So the driving ease effectively leads to a lot of uh, lack of fatigue. Which, yeah, mitigation which, of all of those. Yeah, issues. mitigation of a lot of things which was there. If if you are, uh, if the driving itself is filled with a lot of challenges, yeah. in uh, in in long hauls that leads to a lot of fatigue for the driver, which in, uh, indirectly would would lead to more accidents. Mm. So I think these three interventions can definitely help from the government side. Fourth, I think, which is in terms of a uh, a lot of support which has happened is in terms of a cross organization connect. If there is say certain uh, cross organization connects which can enable us to ensure investment from uh, say private firms mm. onto uh, say OEMs, right. that has also happened which is happening right now in say some of the co-panels would agree in case of EVs. For right. A similar way can, can be enabled in case of, of uh, say, better vehicles or, or say, sort of driver trainings. So, 
that okay. is what I would. Uh, All right, good four points. Anyone wants to add? More? Yeah. yeah, I think you started with a very important note that common minimum program that is between OEMs, industry, hmm. that what exactly and government that what policy interventions we need from the government, what type of improvement in vehicle quality we require and what type of drivers training schools are needed and how government can collaborate with the industry. So the first cross functional, uh, cross industry people need to meet along with OEMs to decide that what should be our common minimum program and how, what should be our ask from the government. Right, right, yeah. So I just wanted to be, I think we all are very clearly aligned and accept that there is a requirement of a clear ma minimum mandate right. from government, from the driver training perspective, as well as the kind of the vehicle which we are using in the country. But I think one more area which we need to focus is in case of accidents, right? Uh, there is always, uh, this. Just all accident doesn't result into the fatalities, right? Yeah. And how important is the post-accident care, right? How fast we can actually make the ambulance service available, how fast we can provide the necessary uh, yeah. all trauma facility to the to the victim, it's also important and that's where government also can play a very big role in, in making sure that the post-accident care is as fast as possible. Now, I think as we improve the infrastructure, it becomes even critical, more critical. I think that's probably one of the reasons you have a better infrastructure, the probability of accidents are getting higher and higher because you have a great road, you drive faster. And if you drive faster, you really need to behave well. Because in those roads, a small error at 100 kilometers per hour is a big accident, right? Yeah. And you don't have a proper infrastructure, you can't even drive faster. So there's a very low probability of having an accident. So what are, the, what are we going to do as we improve the infrastructure? What are the you know, control measures that we can have? Can, you know, if you, again, in, in developed nations, you'll see that every Every alternate few meters, you will start having cameras tracking you, you know, and, and it's, then they send you a bill, even you don't need to talk. The bill comes to you and you have to pay. If you don't pay, your vehicle doesn't get renewed. So the controls have to be effective and infrastructure has to be there. I, I heard this couple of years back, how are you going to bring a dignity to this profession Very good. so that people will start owning the trucks? Today, even if I have money, I'll not buy a truck and become a truck driver. Why would I become? I'll put up a shop. I'll put up a... Is there a way to start making this as a, as a sort of a mini industry where you encourage people to, you know, bring... Dig I think the first reason why people don't do that is dignity. They to bring dignity to that. They don't have dignity because... Show it because as a privilege. Privilege. It's, mm. it's, a, it's a profession to be in. And then encourage to people to own trucks. When they own trucks, they will do exactly what you are saying about. Right. So that's a huge role. Again, it's a society. It's a government. I mean, I, mean, I even heard some of our leaders talking about the dignity of the driver. So how do we build that into is going to be also be critical. You know, India has an agenda, and that is by 2025 to actually reduce the number of road accidents or fatalities to half. Uh, from all that we've spoken about in this room, can we do it? 2025. Arpit, you want Hazar a guess? So, I think uh, in terms of uh, the cheek, the critical infra changes that will enable the uh, that particular number in the near future is something which is definitely possible. Uh, to reach the number uh, by 2025 seems a tall ask. However, I would say that we are on the path with some critical changes which we have seen in the past. And, uh, and that I feel is something which can enable us, and if the similar measures are taken in the future, can enable us to reach that number really, really quickly. What can companies like you do to, you know, help India get or reduce the number of fatalities? Because that is also costing the GDP quite a lot. Oh, you bet. So we currently have the device which, the basic one actually, every two minutes uh, it calculates the yawn, uh, how many times you yawn in a minute and therefore it sends out a beep. That is the basic one. The slightly advanced one actually sees how many times you blink and according to your blink rate, it sends out the beep. Then there is one more device which actually calculates the, the various stages of sleep from stage one to stage eight and therefore it sends out a beep. 
All this we are doing. While it is slightly beneficial, many companies have said that 30 to 40 percent reduction is happening. In accidents. In accidents. But we still feel we can do much better. So we are now coming out with something called a pupil dilator observer. Okay. So it's a small camera which is fixed on the on the right side pillar of the driver, which only focuses on your pupils. And before sleep onset, it will warn the driver that you know you are likely to fall asleep in the next uh, so and so. And that is a technology which we are in the works. Probably in the next few couple of months or something we will release it. Then we also have things like a seat vibrator. Mm -hmm. So. सब कुछ करने के बाद अलार्म देने के बाद भी ड्राइवर नहीं रुक रहा है तो सीट को हिलाओ। बिलीव मी समवेयर डी गाय हैज टू गेट डी मैसेज एंड मेनी पीपल सेड सर आपका वॉल्यूम तो बहुत कम है सर तो नहीं नहीं दे रहा है कुछ भी इंडिया में एंड देन वी रियलाइज्ड इन डी वेस्टर्न कंट्रीज इट्स एयर कंडीशन and then we realized the output in India has to be literally double. Mm. So from 75 decibels, we are now making it 110 decibels, wow. which is like a literally like a loud horn inside the, mm. and just about audible now. So now people are saying, yeah, at least this mm. much should be there. So technology wise, we are trying various stunts, but ultimately, kitna bhi tumko information do, the driver has to wake up and do it. All right. Time for closing thoughts now. Uh, sir, you know, as yeah. among the senior most members of the industry, you know what? You know, so far we were talking about drivers, drivers training road saf safety, but we were not talking too much about vehicles. Mm. So whatever vehicle comes for loading, there has to be a system of mandatory checks. That eight or ten mandatory checks, which are essential to certify a vehicle that it is fit for transit. So that has been introduced, and our observations are that is helping us a lot. Okay. So that, these are, this is something that others can also yeah, emulate. Yes, a vehicle needs to be internally certified for at least mandatory requirements. Okay. Like a pre-flight checkup. Yes, okay. yes, okay. that is happening. Okay, all right. Uh, you know, five of you are gathered here today. What, how can you make a start? You know, five different companies. What is it that you can uh, begin which can then gain momentum and you know maybe become bigger, wider and gain higher acceptance. What is it that we can do? So start from your family, let them follow because you might talk hundred things but ultimately what you do your family follows. So make sure you set the rules by doing it yourself first. So lane discipline, lane discipline, heart breaking, heart acceleration. And when your family is there, make sure all this is happening. For example, if my wife was sitting next to me and I put the camera for, you know, testing out a new feature, she's saying, why you put the camera? For what? I mean, it's, our privacy is disturbed. I said, it's technology. It's going to tell you many more things than, you know, just talk about privacy. But eventually when we had a near miss accident and then the device captured it, she said, yes, this really works. So one is, you said Safety the, begins at home. Safety begins at home, absolutely. And then embrace technology, understand what it does and then talk about it and spread the news. That's, that's right. my take. At a corporate level, how, how, how does this all translate? You know, you look at the Amisa region. So talk to us about, uh, you know, briefly if you can, about how, uh, how you see this in other places. Yeah, so I think, see, the, uh, if you look at the Amisa region, the challenges are pretty much the same, same in terms of the external environment in which we operate. And hence, the, more, the top most concern or I would say the priority for us to make sure that when our drivers are on the road, we make sure that they are safe, right? And the technology which we are using, we are usually investing in this AI technology and all our trucks are equipped with that. But we are also taking that to the next level. So we have a fleet control tower which is placed in the central uh, part of the region in Cairo, Egypt. And uh, it's a 24 by 7 manned operation. And this fleet control tower continuously take input from this AI technology and they are actually monitoring the driver behavior. Anything which they see as kind of a violation or they see that there is a risk to the driver, there is a immediate communication to the driver. So it's not that automated communication, it's a real time somebody is talking to the driver right. and making him or her alert about the risk on the road, right? So it's making a huge difference in terms of how we intervene and can actually avoid any serious incidents on the road. And apart from that, I think this technology and it gives us huge amount of data. Yeah. Now, while we have been already proactive in terms of 
taking the right action, real time action in avoiding incident. Now this data we want to use as more as a predictive analysis we can do and identify certain and trends. And model it. Yes, absolutely. And, and then really can have more of a predictive approach rather than a kind of a reactive approach, approach. to entire solution, right? So that's the way we look at this and we clearly see a huge impact on ground. So it's, for us, it's more of a, I would say, strategic investment than an expenditure because we also talk about that and we yeah. never see this from the expenditure point of view. It's actually an investment we are doing in the business. All right. Okay. Final thoughts, Venkat. Whenever technology comes, the initial impression is it is a cost bad. Mm. But I think when you actually overlay the benefits of it, when the adoption comes, when the scale comes, it, it is always a productive uh, intervention that will come to. For us, I think along with the technology, it's very much has been into investing into building the safety as a culture. Mm -hmm. so it, we have done this very well as a corporate in within our side, within where we have control. Now it is more about doing it outside the society, like in defensive training and means encouraging them, celebrating them, rewarding them, and trying to. It's 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 a process. It will slowly. Work in progress. I mean, if you ask me what. Were I as safe as when I got to work, when I started work? No. Today, I'm as safe as I can be. Took time to me. But I will change four of them. Right. right. They will change many of them. So, it will come. We have to stay invested and we continue to stay invested there. It's a matter of time. It's a matter of time. Technology will accelerate it. Right. And a matter of will, Arpit. So, I would say two ways. One is that from a cost standpoint, when you look at it, don't look at it only from manpower perspective, because that uh, would mean a pro bono, right? I would believe that look at it also from the uh, safety of your goods, which effectively is a cost to company. If you go to service a customer and essentially does not have the required shelf life or is damaged, will he accept the product? He would not. And essentially in many of these cases, unsafe conditions or uh, bad driving or for example, bad quality of vehicle would lead to uh, either man uh, power issues or uh, in worse situation man power loss. But more often than not, uh, goods damaged, right. and effectively that essentially is a direct cost to company. So mm -hmm. when we have looked at doing that, there are two things that we have said: is that we'll try and measure what is unsafe tasks, <coughs> what is near misses, what is lost time accidents, mm -hmm. and once you start reporting that effectively the encouragement should come in terms of reporting. So we have, we have started a measure wherein if somebody reports an accident or is seen as an unsafe fact, rather than uh, punitive action, yeah. we say yeah. we will we'll reward you the next right. time. And effectively that is a culture which is driving. So you are driving that sort of behavioral change wherein, as well. Yes. So when saying that, and essentially that starts again, as I said, in end to end value chain. The second part which we have sort of started uh, doing that is to try and translate it to is how this can ensure you uh, lower your uh, one is in terms of your fuel usage to the transporter. Secondly, the amount of damages that uh, is there for the organization. And, and at the end of the day, when you look at the cost benefit analysis of it, I, at least for uh, the FMCG industry and a lot of consumer good industry, I would say that uh, such changes would, would uh, even if done f more from a road safety standpoint, would not uh, translate to a major loss. Oh. So at, at long term, it might translate to huge amount of profits in terms of your overall shelf time and the quality of your products. All right, yeah. So safety equals to profits. All right. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. Some very interesting thoughts. I hope that, you know, this forum can only grow and more voices join this chorus where you have identified safety as a critical pillar and continue to build on safety, not just in your organizations, but in our country at large. Thank you so very much for being a part of this conversation today. Safety concerns you. Safety concerns me. It is now important that together we try and improve India's safety record when it comes to road crashes. And this can be done. Thank you very much for being a part of this conversation and we'll see you soon again next time.